adoption of the agenda. Uh, administration, we have any any uh, changes or additional solutions? Uh, just one if I could ask the committee if they could uh, move up 6.4 as the first business item. Uh, uh, due to the fact that we have asset management uh, delegation and follow up with the discussion on draft policy would be kindly. So we'll just switch 6.1, 6.4 around. Council? Uh, yeah, I'll just I'll move to accept the agenda as amended. Thank you. All those in favor? Carried unanimously. So we are on to delegation 3.1, Stab Tech, Asset Management Presentation. Good evening. Uh, tonight we have Brad Vanderveen from Stab Tech. He's our engineering consultant that works primarily with the town. And he will be leading the asset management presentation. Good evening, and yeah, thank you. I just uh, want to do a quick intro of our team here. Uh, I myself am not a, an expert, of course, I know a lot of infrastructure, particularly Blackfelds here. Um, but I'll oh, thank you. But uh, no, I just want to introduce, uh, of course, you all know Todd Simonson. He's been working with, uh, with the town here for 20 years and pretty much knows it like the back of his hand. And then we got uh, Joel Sawatsky here. Um, he's our managing lead with the water group and also has uh, asset management certification is, and has implemented it uh, a little bit here too. And then last but not least, uh, Dorian Wanzura. He's our asset management expert and he'll be doing the, the presentation for you guys. He has about uh, 20 years of experience uh, with uh, municipalities, big and small, including uh, like Edmonton and, and uh, Regina and Saskatoon and stuff. And uh, yeah, so he's, uh, he's got 20 years uh, in this business. Thank you. Thanks, Brett. Uh, Mike, could you flip the presentation, uh, screen over the presentation if you want to work? Thank you. Uh, thanks for having us today. Um, as uh, Brad said, um, my name is Dorian Wanzura. A little fun fact, um, Myron and I actually, I started my career about 30 miles down the road from mm -hmm. Myron. But so while Myron was in, in yeah. Melville, Saskatchewan, I was starting my career in York in Saskatchewan. And fun fact number two, some of the lessons that I learned in that neck of the woods still carry with me today. And I teach them that stuff uh, ongoing. So lots of good stuff came out of that part of the world. I thought I found uh, something. You won't go that far. I'm feeling pretty proud of Isn't that where quarter gas came from? It rocks out of the province, but close. Um, so thanks for having us. Uh, so we're going to talk a little bit today, um, we're working on about a 30 minute uh, presentation um, lot, and I, I like to do this uh, very interactive so I'm probably going to stop and maybe walk around a little bit with Mr. Chairman if that's okay with you with the pending protocol um, and have a bit of an engaged conversation, we'll have to do it uh, two directions uh, and it should take us half an hour then we're going to stop and, and like to have a bit of a conversation with you and we'll open it up to the floor for any correct questions you might have uh, you might be saving. So we're going to go over uh, some of the state of infrastructure in Canada Real, real uh, quick overview. We're going to talk about um, asset management in, in, as a practice and the this uh, the discipline, what it is. Uh, we're going to spend a little bit of time on level of service and risk and mitigation. So those are really two pieces of asset management that belong to the governance table with all of you. And we'll talk. We'll connect back about um, about some of the outcomes uh, that would benefit the town of Black Falls uh, through the use of asset management practices and principles. And then some Q and A. So uh, in Canada. Um, uh, a number of practitioners have been talking about this for 20 years, about the state of the infrastructure in Canada, the infrastructure deficit. Uh, and in 2012 and 2016, a number of professionals, just like your public work staff, uh, collaborated uh, with the government and FCM to develop the state of uh, the Canadian infrastructure report cards. And the next couple of slides are excerpts from them. And you can see uh, uh, up the top here, this is uh, each of these bars there is a, a category of infrastructure from potable water, wastewater, stormwater, roads, etc. Uh, and, and along the side is the is the condition rating, from very good in the bottom to very poor in the top. Uh, and really quickly, uh, across Canada, uh, as noted in 2016 by, by a professional such as we all have on staff, um, about 30% of Canada's infrastructure, municipal local infrastructure, was rated poor or very poor condition. 
So generally across the board, if you're a glass half full person, you can say that you know 50 or 60 percent is good. Uh, but that doesn't mean that that doesn't get away from the fact that 30 percent is poor or very poor. Um, again, same uh, infrastructure report card. Um, uh, Canadian professionals were asked across the country, uh, what do you spend, What is the right amount of money to spend and reinvest in infrastructure? What percentage of value would be would be the right uh, percentage of value? Um, what you've got uh, here is what the Canadian, Canadian infrastructure professionals have told us. That somewhere along the lines, uh, we should be spending between one at one or one and a half or two percent of value of infrastructure. Uh, reinvesting, just like we invest, reinvest in a house, like we reinvest in our own capital assets. Um, and we should be reinvesting at that rate. The orange line in the bottom really is what municipalities uh, across Canada are investing. So generally across Canada, uh, municipalities, local governments are under-investing in the assets that we own. And there's a significant number of assets that the municipal governments own. Uh, quick, uh, quick math question, this is the interactive part of the question, uh, interactive part of the, the uh, uh, presentation. So let's look at the bottom left uh, water mains, potable water and linear infrastructure. Uh, Canadian professionals and, and municipalities have kind of said that the minimum amount of infrastructure you should, minimum amount of reinvestment you should be making annually is about 1%. If you are reinvesting uh, in your infrastructure at 1% of value per year, how long would it take to replace that whole network? 1% of value, if I spent 1% of what was worth every year, Hundred years, your worship. Surprises. I'm so here. Wasn't even thinking about it. Yes, if you and your water mains are going to last hundred years, and you replace them at a rate of one percent a year, it'll last. You know, you'll get there in hundred years. Um, same sort of thing. If you in, uh, invested in a rate of two percent per year, you replace the whole system in fifty years. Uh, anybody want to take a venture? This is a, a wastewater, a stormwater, waste linear in here. Uh, that, that number is 0.3% annual reinvestment for stormwater, uh, stormwater assets. Uh, quick math, your worship. Uh, how long will it take Canadian municipalities to replace the stormwater assets in Canada at that <coughs> reinvestment rate? 0.3%. 0.3%? 0.3%. Okay. Yeah. 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 300 years. 300 years. <laughs> Councillor Taylor. Yeah. Math. Is that Councillor Taylor? Yeah. Um, yes. Uh, at the rate Canadian municipalities are, are reinvesting in our stormwater assets, it will take 300 or so years to renew them. Anybody want to put uh, put money on three uh, stormwater assets lasting 300 years? <laughs> Probably not. But we're doing it. In Canada, we're doing it. And the last sort of Canadian, state of the Canadian uh, uh, situation, circumstance, is that across Canada, uh, all of these asset classes, water, wastewater, stormwater, uh, they add up to about $1.1 trillion of assets invested by local governments and communities. And over time, the conditions are declining. Year to year to year, the condition is declining. And if you think about $1.1 trillion of assets across all the households in Canada, it works out to around $80,000 of, of infrastructure is um, owned and contributed to by every household in Canada. And one of the ways that I like to think about this is a bit like an RSP. If I have an RSP, it's a personal saving account. Um, if I had $8,000 in my, my RSP account today, would I want to see it the same or better when I retire? I'm hoping better. Would anybody want to see their RSP decline in value between today and retirement? Probably not. Um, but what we have here is that Canadian households have invested $80,000 of value in the community infrastructure. And that is declining. It's declining over time. And it's not much different than um, our investments, how they perform over time. I mean, nobody wants to decline. I wouldn't want to tell my, my spouse, my family, gee, we're all we're broke. Um, I want to make sure that I'm, I'm uh, maintaining and enhancing the value of those assets. So that's a bit about Canada. Um, well, on one hand, it's a, it's a bit of a grim story. On the other hand, uh, Canadian municipalities um, have risen to the challenge over the last number of years. The federal government has come to, uh, come to recognize over the last 15 years the value of infrastructure and local infrastructure, and they've supported it. And they've supported asset management programs through the federal NAP program. So what is asset management? Uh, there's a couple things that it is not. 
um, it is not a report that sits in your shelf. Uh, yeah, a report it will probably be part of the product. Um, a report will probably be, you got to have somewhere to, to gather, to collect your knowledge, to work from. You've got to have something that, uh, that you, you grow, evolve, uh, and, um, and change over time. Uh, but it is not a report by itself. It's also not software. You'll probably, you know, software is, is a tool. Software is, is, is part of it. You'll probably need software to, uh, uh, to manage, to manage the knowledge and the data that you have. Um, but it's not where you start. It's a component of it. Asset management um, really is, it's a process and it's a way of how you make decisions about how you manage infrastructure. Uh, it's a way that you make decisions that um, thinks about uh, managing infrastructure today, thinking about tomorrow's needs. It thinks about the risks, opportunities, and how you make best use of resources. So asset management is not, it's not, it's, I've said this a number of times in workshops, it's not software, it's not a plan. They can have, they can have those as part of your, part of your work, uh, but it doesn't start there. So that's really important. And asset management, there's really um, seven and a half. Started with seven, uh, the last one got added uh, the last half, half dozen years or so. Uh, seven key questions. If you can answer these, uh, you are in really good shape. You, you really know, you know, the seven key questions are what do you want, where is it, what's it worth, what's its remaining service life, what conditions it's in, what do we spend, what should we spend, uh, what's the gap, and how do we get to sustainable infrastructure, and the last half question is really about resiliency, how resilient is our infrastructure. A uh, little other uh, municipal trivia, the first seven questions were were, um, uh, were a bit of an epiphany by the city engineer in Hamilton about 1997, Leo Goye. Uh, the story goes, as Leo tells it, uh, he woke up in the middle of the night, two in the morning, and I had this, this epiphany that I only know these seven things. I could really, I could really keep the city in good shape, grab his notepad, wrote down all seven, seven scribbles, and went back to bed. Um, and they stood the test of time, 20 years later. And then the last half question, how resilient, resilient is our infrastructure, really is, a, is, a, uh, is an outcome of climate change, uh, managing risk. Uh, being recognized that we need to be thinking about infrastructure in the next century differently than the first century. How was the end of So asset management. Um, and, and nobody does, you know, we don't, municipalities don't have assets just to have assets. Uh, we have assets that deliver services. A road is only good if it, if it provides transportation, mobility, connects people, offers, offers access for goods and services. That's what roads are for. Roads are to enable connectivity between parts of the community and communities. Skating rinks, sports fields, parks, those are facilities and assets that we, the communities, have to offer recreation opportunities, to build quality of life, to build youth sports opportunities. That's why we have rinks, sports fields, and parks. Fire halls and fire trucks, for community safety, fire prevention, emergency response. It's the, it's the what we deliver, the services we deliver, as the assets are how we deliver them and the, and the physical things that we deliver those services through. So assets aren't, aren't there for themselves, they're there uh, to deliver a value-added service for the community. We deliver a service, uh, deliver a service for, for your constituents at a level that they want. So a little time of an interactive part of the, part of the presentation. Um, based on what we've talked about, uh, does anybody feel that they are fully confident to asset management on their own? Anybody think you've done it already, perhaps? Uh, who's got a house? Who owns a house? I'm going to put on the table and propose that you're already asset managers. Uh, managing assets, the physical assets of the community, are much like managing your home. Changing shingles, replacing windows, Painting the baseboards, looking after the landscape, make sure the drainage works, keep your basement dry. All those are things that we do every day at home uh, for our own personal circumstance that are identical to the thought process that, that, that we, we can bring to work. Anybody replace shingles in their house? In their, anyway, your worship, did you replace the windows at the same time? Why not? Because it was too expensive. Too expensive? So you made some choices. We did, when, we did it a year later, but well, that, oh, that's a, that's a, that's an excellent question. So, yes, you made some choices. Well, when and how much to do, and and what point to make your reinvestments. 
you could have done both at the same time. You might not have taken any vacations for the next year, but you could have you made some choices. So the things that, and then what's really important is that um, the, the decisions we make about our home and our municipality um, are really both, they're different for everyone of you. Um, uh, your worship, Mayor, uh, Mayor Poole, made some changes, uh, made some decisions about his reinvestment. It might have been different for some other, other councillors. Um, if you're an owner or a renter, would your decisions be any different? They would be? How oh, so? Uh, councillor Pell? Uh, yeah. Um, well, just you're not, you're going to be more, as a renter, you'd be more concerned about the inter internal structure as opposed to the structure excellent yeah great Councilor Uber, you're looking oh well, yeah you, if i'm renting I, it's not my responsibility per se yeah absolutely um as i was thinking about this i was thinking about uh, when i was a young baby engineer in yorkton living with four other four other young kids and we were renting and it was a 1997 winter 1997 winter was brutal winter uh, a yeah, month. That part oh, it's brutal. <laughs> brutal. 30 days of below, 25 below. Um, and, and the ice dams are so big around our house, um, water, they were melting, and water is actually coming through the litter, through, this, through the plastic ceiling of the litter. And you four renters are going, well, we're moving out in a month, or we can call the landlord and he'll tear up the litter room for the next month and we'll be inconvenienced. We just got another bucket. <laughs> moving out another month, didn't matter to us. But as council, are council renters or owners? Or stewards of your community? Both. Both. Tell me why both council children. Well, because there are certain things that, that we uh, don't particularly own. Some of the roads that we might have to deal with or some of the infrastructure. And then there's other stuff, jurisdictions. Other jurisdictions. Yeah. There's things that we we own as assets, whether it's our facilities or our infrastructure in the ground or on top of the ground. A dual role. You might have you have a responsibility for the assets and services you provide. You have an advocacy. Role and if the provincial it. government pushes provincial the P three partnerships, we may not own as much. <laughs> we might, in a yeah. sense, right? We, we should. I now, there's, there's a whole that's a philosophical conversation. You go down that road for a long time. I've done two P threes in my career. Yeah. Um, then Mike. No, one was wonderful. The other jury's out. Yeah, I know. <laughs> but uh, we'll see how they turn out. So owners and renters uh, important in terms of. So asset management, as a uh, as a system, it's it's all about uh, four things, four dimensions. And really, what I've done here is kind of map those seven and a half questions: what we own, where is it, you know, the categories of risk, level of service, inventory, and condition. And that's really kind of if you've got all four of these pieces, if you as a counselor are thinking about risk, uh, if you're you as a counselor are thinking about level of service, your administration. Able to give you advice about condition and what you own and inventory, you really have you're really, really well positioned to uh, uh, to be to be to be executing on a well thought out asset management plan. So we're going to get into level of service and risk, and we've got two uh, two very different uh, modes of transportation here. I'm going to take 30 seconds to ask you to think of them, and I'm going to ask you which one you would have. You've got a choice to have one of these 1958 Cadillac. Or probably a 1994 Volkswagen Golf. Two different cars. They get you from A to B. Well, if you think of which one you'd, you'd uh, like to have in your garage and why. Only one. Anyone want to offer an opinion? Councilor Stenton? I would take the Golf. Golf. Okay, we have one Golf. Councilor Taylor. Golf it takes less room. I can keep my tools. <laughs> <laughs> Two golfs. Councilor Hoover. Three golfs. Councilor Apple. Oh, I had a Volkswagen and it was like the worst vehicle ever. So <laughs> I don't think I can fairly make it. But no, obviously the more reliable vehicle. Four. Your worship? That Cadillac has lasted a long time. Yeah. So it's still in good shape, apparently. Yeah. It has stood the test of time and it's doing a lot of the right things. The investment has already been there, paid for, as opposed to going in and purchasing a brand new golf. I would really have to find out how much life there is left in that 
car before I moved on. Probably Elvis Presley's too. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> well then it's worth 10 times more. Now I might take it. Okay, but 94 is still pretty good. Council Wolford? I have to take the Cadillac. Cadillac, two Caddies, and four Volkswagens and also as well. If my dad was still alive, he'd tell me to take the Cadillac, but I would have to go with the Golf. Five and two. Uh, and we heard some thoughts on um, gas, gas mileage, space, storage, um, reliability, and service life left. Um, what, if you had, uh, what if you had three kids going to hockey? Would any one of these do? No. You're driving kids around the hockey rink in winter time. That's why I own a caravan. <laughs> That's why you don't care about it. Well, yes. Yeah, the trunk of the catalog is way bigger than the back end of the caravan. <laughs> <laughs> you put three hockey bags out of that one. Three sneaky <laughs> hockey players in the catalog. Yeah. <laughs> or a golf. But, but the important thing is that each of you likely had different different reasons for why you picked this. With each, each one. Space, reliability, gas mileage, how much service life left, father's choices. Um, <laughs> And, and the same way that each of you probably have different, I know you have different reasons for why you lean one or the other. All 10,000 of your citizens have different perspectives on what good is to them. What service level is to them, what they expect, what they require. If you did this with 10,000 people, you'd probably get, I don't know, 3,000 different answers and a half dozen fistfights, <laughs> probably. So level of service is different for everybody. And every circumstance. And we go back to this the, the notion that roads don't exist to be roads, they exist to move people, goods, and services around. Um, recreation centers uh, or skating rinks, park sports fields, and parks don't provide you recreation. Um, and everybody has different views on what the right level of service is. General, a general truism is the higher level of service, the higher the cost. More hours of opening more staff hours to service, uh, more rigs and facilities, more costs. And it's not only about assets and services. Um, your winter road maintenance policy is 24 hours. I'm uh, sorry, you work well on the Look at me, the recreation guy. <laughs> <laughs> right, so the press not here. Correct, the Lord. Lord yeah. Lord. Lord. Uh, Lord. 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 Uh, are you one to roads 24 hours? After yeah. snowfall, three to four or 40 hours? Uh, I think that's what Something on those lines, eight out eight, eight inch snow pack on residential streets. Um, if you wanted to clear your snow in 12 hours instead of 24, could you? All we need is money. That's right. Probably cost you three times as much. But nothing more than people have put salt for it. But service and costs are a highly correlated. I have no idea where that went. Oh, my, my bad. Automation. Um, and levels of service. And when we think about over 10,000 people um, trying to trying to tell you, trying to have a conversation with levels of service, I pulled a couple of these slides out of your budget document, 2019 budget document, uh, your, your uh, public survey. Um, you know, would you adjust funding for infrastructure uh, street services? Half, half your community says no change, of course is up, and of course stay down. Uh, the opposite almost for, uh, for parks and recreation and facilities, parks, recreation facilities and parks. 42% no change, 41% decrease, uh, 17 say increase. Um, very difficult, and I noted that in your, uh, later on your agenda from your, your budget retrieval, um, it's difficult to discern what is the public trying to tell you other than uh, the general tourism, people want more service and less cost, or more service and less access. Uh, what I'd probably suggest is that if you can have a different uh, way to have a conversation with your community, you might get different results. And I, I'm pretty simple. I like green, yellow, red, good, fair, poor. If you said that in 2018, our road network was 20% good and 55% fair and 25% poor, and you had a bit of you had some analytics in behind, you could actually demonstrate that that's what your road network is. And your community said we want it better. Could you could you go and say, you know what, we're gonna have this, we're gonna put a strategy together that we're gonna go from 20% good to 30% good. We're gonna go from 55% fair to 60% fair. We move the 25% forward down to 10%. Sure, you do that. Sure. You put a strategy in it, but articulate that. Um, or is that is that your decision in terms of what what level of service uh, the target should be, or is that council? That's council. Councils. And if you if you have a, a well uh, well put together, robust asset management plan, 
you can look at your services you offer. This is just a roads example or any sort of example, good, fair, poor. Um, but you can move the dial. And by deciding intentionally, consciously, that you want to move the dial, create a different outcome for your community and your, your citizens, change your level of service, uh, Laura can tell you what that what, what would need to happen here. There's probably a cost associated. Remember that higher service, higher cost, there's probably a cost associated. But that's within your wheelhouse to make some decisions about. So risk. Talk a little bit about risk. Um, and risk is, there's lots of places to talk about risk in different ways. If you're in, in banking, you know, financial risk, um, fraud risk, all sorts of things. Um, risk is really uncertain. Risk is really that uh, something might happen uh, that can be either positive or negative, but you don't know what it is. It's that uncertainty that, that um, we just need to be thinking about. And risk mitigation, um, risk is all around us. Uh, risk mitigation is, um, is a pretty, pretty standard way to do it. So you identify risk, you see it, figure out how big of a risk is it. Um, and risk is really just the likelihood of something happening and the impact. And then once you realize what, what's in front of you, you can just decide how to how to treat it, how to deal with it. And I, uh, I, don't, I don't know if there's another interactive part. Anybody here um, do recreational risk management? I tell my, my wife, who's a lawyer, that I'm an amateur lawyer. So she hates it because I'm always giving her legal opinions. And what? Who's a recreational lawyer? Anybody rec want to suggest they might be a recreational risk manager? Councilor Cindy. Every so. parent is. Every parent is exactly. You're one. How much trouble can my little one get in? And what's the likelihood they're going to do something? And what's the impact if they do? And if it's too high, what do you do? Put them in time. Put them in time. <laughs> <laughs> um, exactly. You do something. If the risk is beyond what you are comfortable with, you do something to either lower the impact or reduce the likelihood. But I, um, I live in a pretty, pretty quiet neighborhood. There's only 400 houses in this little three block area. And nobody drives there except for us. And I've got some great neighbors. And in the summertime, uh, we'll often grab a, you know, grab some beer and we'll walk over the street, walk across the street. And most times, I catch myself not looking when I cross the street. So I know that you know, nobody, nobody's here that doesn't live here. I'll just, you know, got the dog in tow and I've got you know, a couple of beer in my hand. And odds are, well, the likelihood of me getting hit as I'm crossing a very, very residential street is pretty low. And even if I did get hit, um, everybody's going slow enough that it doesn't really matter. And there's a fire station three houses down from our place, so I'm probably okay. Um, so I probably, I'm, most of the time I catch myself walking across the street, not even looking. Make sure you don't have the fireman who's a volunteer who takes off when the fire alarm goes. Uh, that raises the risk considerably. That's right. If the lights are lights and sirens are on, get out of the way. No, nobody stops. No, when, uh, they're brought, when they have to respond in their car. Oh, in the car, you don't even know. We do a volunteer fire force or, or volunteer. Okay, volunteer. With with the paid uh, fire chain. Okay, fire chain. So my my level of risk is pretty low walking across my neighbors. If I'm going to walk across a main drag in Edmonton, uh, where you're going to get you know several thousand vehicles a day, uh, the likelihood I'm going to get hit is going to go up. And if I get hit by a car doing 60 or 70, uh, the impact is going to be higher. So. You know, if I still want to get across to see my neighbor and, and bring some beer over, uh, what do I do if I want to cross that busy street? I'm going to look both ways. Pardon me? Look both ways. Look both ways. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Use a crosswalk. Ideally, find one with the pedestrian light. Um, and even if a uh, car stops, I want to make sure that I'm looking the driver right in the eye so that he sees me, so he's not texting and all that sort of thing. If my neighbor lived across the QE2, where would my likelihood of impact put me? But you get across the highway here. You better run really fast. I better run really fast. That's farther than the 90s, right? Um, I, I, I submit it's a, an incredibly high likelihood I'm going to get hit, and doing 130, I'm probably not going to make it. So my risk is way up here. So, so I'm again. I think that we do. We everybody does risk, um, just like looking after kids. You have kids, you manage their risk, um, and risk. Um, can, can have a number of different impacts uh, in a municipal government. Risk can impact structural capacity, function, washouts, bridge failures. Um, it can you know, can impact your insurance rates. 
uh, you, you know, risk risk uh, can lead to uh, degradation of, of your service. And in terms of risk options, you've got a couple options. You do nothing. If you're quite comfortable with the level of risk you're at, doing nothing's an option. That's okay. Uh, or you, if you say, you know, um, we know it's we, we 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 can't stop. We'll reduce the likelihood. We know that a tornado might come through. Is this tornado on the be tornado on close by? A little more probably southeast, right? Yeah. Not here. Not here. Um, but if you lived in Tornado Alley, you've got very little opportunity to reduce the likelihood of a tornado. So you might want to have an emergency response plan. Um, you might want to, to back up your, your emergency supplies and, and have a, a, a plan that's ready to go. Or you might want to build more resilient infrastructure. If you're in Winnipeg and you can't stop flooding the Red River, how about you harden your, harden your crossings and harden your, your, uh, your approaches? So back to asset management. Again, taken together, uh, taking all these four dimensions of risk, the level of service, inventory condition, that is really the crux of, um, uh, of an asset management plan. And taken together, uh, they do a number of things. One, they put you in the driver's seat. You can make some informed decisions about what level of service you think is appropriate for the community. You can really put your finger on what level of risk you're willing to, to accept and think that is reasonable for the community. And together with your inventory condition, um, that creates a long-term financial plan for you. And one of the things that's really important as counselors, you, you're, you, the space you work in is above the line, risk and level of service. The space Laura works in is below the line inventory condition. That's just facts, data, um, that's just the state of the nation. So one, one forward. So, some of the outcomes, I'm kind of closing at the end here. Some of the outcomes that would be available to council as a, you know, with, a, with a robust asset management plan is, is a long-term financial plan. I see that um, you've got a, a multi-year capital, is it a five-year capital plan you have now? Ten. Ten year? Ten year? How many assets that the town owns last 10 years? Probably not very many. I'd say How much new infrastructure you're asking in the last 10 years? Any. Well, you life cycle. Life cycle of 10 years. No, are you asking what we're adding or what's the what, what What infrastructure is owned and controlled by the town that's a 10 year life cycle? Um, 10 year. Not much. Not much. Ten vehicles. Years. Vehicles, yeah. Vehicles and equipment, yeah. yeah. I think they're over pretty yeah. But 10 years is a blink of an eye in the municipal world. Tools. A little slack. But um, your facility is the city hall. Life cycle is the city hall, probably 75 years with proper maintenance. Um, your underground infrastructure, easily 100. Concrete, 75, 85, 95, 100. Um, and so sometimes you just want to make sure that by looking at a 10-year capital plan, there is there's more on the horizon. So this is a, a long-term financial plan from another municipality. Um, it really just projects from 2019 up to 20, way up there, 80 years, 2080, 2090. Um, and you know, if they had a, if they were looking at a capital plan in 10 years, you think we're we got we're good, we got, we're golden, we got no nothing to spend our money on. And as they started working through the asset management planning, the life cycle planning. Hey, wait a second, we have a bit of a bump here, both years 12, 14, 15. Uh, that's a whole bunch of assets sort of come to end of life, we should be thinking about that. And then not much for another 30 or 40 years, they had a big investment. Um, provincial grants had to build a ton of infrastructure, and then more and more and more and more. Um, and really this got them thinking about, okay, um, this, this bump and this spike doesn't impact our decisions today, but we need to be mindful of it. We can, we can be thinking about what are our financial policies to deal with these. Uh, when we know we have lumpy spending, do we cash, do we cash replace, do we get fund, do we pay as you go? Uh, what, are, what are some of the financial policies we need to be thinking about? And by the way, if we wanted to reduce this peak, could it be something along the, on the, along the way in terms of level of service management um, or other investments to, to manage that peak downwards? So I might, I just want to you know, point out that Having a three-year operating budget, five and ten-year capital budget is good, uh, really good. I'd also suggest that a ten-year and twenty-year financial forecast is probably also uh, part of the order of the day. This gives you long enough time to see things coming, uh, 
this may or may not ever happen given time technology and all that sort of stuff. Um, but you know what's out here and you can make some decisions well in advance. Uh, in terms of more outcomes, again, thinking about this risk level service, um, you mentioned the conversation in your community. Uh, the, budget, the budget survey asking folks for uh, input on spending, on air, priority areas, on less priority areas. An asset management, a robust asset management plan can change the nature of your conversation with your community. So right now, the conversation probably goes with something like, how much does it cost and what are taxes and do you want to spend more or less? I think in the future, you get to a spot where you're having a conversation with your community about what level of service is appropriate and what do you desire. You know, right now, the conversation is probably around how do we reduce costs? I'm sure internally, Myers has gone to step. How do we reduce costs? Um, a different conversation with council might be what's the right amount of risk to take on? And the last, the last sort of you know, another dimension is um, a conversation with your community here's what we do versus can you participate? We invite you in to participate in setting our several levels of service and risk levels. We invite you in as community stakeholders to help us provide input into our decision making versus us telling you uh, what we do. Different dimensions. And then lastly, uh, I took a quick look here at the sustainability, sustainability plan. I think there's a ton of things in here that, that are related and, and, and relevant um, to the work you're doing in especially around asset management. So you have a number of dimensions, your community life dimension. Um, I think that uh, by having a, a different conversation with your community, you can act, uh, invite them to help set their quality of life. You can invite the community to, to talk to you directly about recreation opportunities, level of service. On the economy front, um, by seeing a long-term financial plan well in advance, you can make some decisions to lower your total cost of ownership and operation. You can only lower your tax rate by seeing by, by, by actively managing your assets. On the infrastructure and the buildings front, uh, obviously managing assets. Uh, reducing costs, uh, building sustainable infrastructure is all key. On the leadership and engagement front, um, you know, collaboration with citizens, uh, work together to set service levels, take their input into Facebook and help, help have that set your service level. Engage in a two-way dialogue. Uh, and it can also help you be innovative in, in your service delivery by really getting to the, uh, really, really nailing down what is it you do, how do you do it, and how do you know you do it well. And lastly, uh, the natural environment. As much as we think of infrastructure and assets as hard assets, um, infrastructure and natural assets are just as valuable uh, to a community as hard built assets. They will trees, GHG sinks, uh, natural water, water courses and wetlands. Those are all important parts of urban infrastructure and that natural. So those are the sort of the, the general outcome, outcomes uh, that you could expect. Uh, from a well, well put together asset management plan. And we've kind of covered in about 30 minutes, about 30 minutes or so, 35. Uh, we've covered kind of the Canadian experience, works through just a really high level view of asset management. Uh, well, we've, we've decided you're all, you are all amateur and, and practicing level of service centers and risk managers. And we've kind of come down to hear some of the benefits. So that is really the extent of our 30 minute presentation. And we'd be happy to and we'll love to answer your questions. Mr. Tiller? Yeah, uh, <clears throat> this is a really good topic. I mean, there's a lot of ways that we can go with it. One of the things that we uh, talked about, we heard a lot about when we had our election was the intelligence of being able to manage some of our infrastructure. You know, uh, today there's so many different ways of seeing what your infrastructure is doing um, and going down that intellectual highway and the costs and the benefits back and forth on that. I mean, there's so is we're not talk we're not going to go down that road, or is that something that you would propose? You know, um, here's here's my my personal professional opinion is that you can you can sometimes you can be too smart by half, um, and I'll tell you why. So and some so asset management is is some people scale management. Um, in, in a community of uh, black falls, you have um, you guys have 60 kilometers of 60 kilometers of water and sort of roughly 200 200 meters of block, well, 350 blocks 
of stuff. So third degree flux. You can kind of you can get your head around that scale of of, of infrastructure, and you can I'd probably suggest you can pretty good with with Excel in terms of managing your assets for the first little while. As you get more more sophisticated, more complex, more complex, uh, more complex activities, you can look somewhere else. But I'm not my gut. My I've always told people start easy, um, but start fast. So I, I don't know if I got your question, but, but I'm never one. I'm all, I'm a techie. I'm, I'm a super techie okay. by nature, but I'm always cautious of being too smart by half and chasing the fourth decimal place. Close. Yeah, both. So I'm going to ask you this rather than manager Tema, and I believe she'll appreciate this. Um, one of the things that have come up in the last, or I just read in the last six months, was that asset management and inclusion of the natural environment on things like um, uh, water, stormwater management should be included in your asset management plan and recording. Is it something that is being utilized? Is it a future thing that's going to happen 10 years down the road? Or is it something that communities should be looking at right now to be inclusive in it? I think the latter right now. I mean, if, you, if you go back to you know, the, the, what, the what we do are services and the how we do our assets. So, you know, um, for years, the easiest way to deal with stormwater is just build a cash basin and a pipe. Probably in the last 20 years, low impact drainage, uh, where you've got sort of active, actively constructed and engineered green spaces to collect rainwater, run them through um, engineered wetlands for filtration as well as stormwater management, uh, become much more, much more uh, important. And so I think that you know, one, you want to manage stormwater. Two, the how you do it, uh, you can start making some decisions around engineered or, or natural wetlands, natural assets. So as a fault. As a follow-up to that, um, is there a way, is there a quantified, because we have, we have uh, some of the most outstanding and progressive storm management plans, stormwater management plans in the province as far as I'm concerned. And is there a way to quantify that so that it can be put into an asset management and things that we have to do to maintain it or, or keep it up? And as you're moving out into the um, areas that we are expanding to, we need to keep areas in order to, it's, it's cheaper to keep it rather than put in gray, uh, gray, gray um, structures too. The short answer is yes. And Joel might have a longer answer, I'm wondering. Um, but the short answer is yes. And then that's part of your long-term financial plan. Okay. So I'm just going to pull a, pull a slide ahead here. I put a couple in here. Um, Okay, let's do this one. So when I think about, about levels of service, I think about you know the top level is the the what we the why we do things, right? Like the, that's what the community sees. The community needs to be protected from draining, over you know, flooding and drainage, stormwater needs to be managed. That's what you do. This middle part is what do you do to deal with it? Do you, do you create engineered structures? Do you use you know, engineered wetlands, natural water courses? Each of those options has a, has a unique set of costs. But it's about what do you want to do and what do you want to achieve? And ultimately, this, you know, this drives down to kind of your cost per unit. So what's your cost per hectare for development of a stormwater management front? All through those engineered, um, engineered built assets, natural, ass natural water courses, and engineered. Uh, drainage will all have different cost profiles, but the key is you know, you can make some decisions, right? Like the worst thing in the world is you make some decisions and kind of hope you hope you got it right. You want to see, you'll be able to see the see the roads in front of you, make some decisions. Well, level of service. Here's what I believe. Here's what counts the size, and we fully know the cost and, and outcomes. Councilor Taylor. There we go. So I have a two-part question. One is, is one of the big things is, and the provincial government could learn a lesson from this going back to Ralph Klein, is when you underfund something, you leave, you kick the can down the road far enough that somebody, when they have to pick it up, 
it can weigh so much they might not have the capacity to lift it so you know and it's um it's kind of like a boat leaking if you take a, a cup out of water as it's leaking you can stay in it but eventually it'll start to take on water and uh so we kind of came into that when i first started as a counselor is, is we didn't have funding for some of the important assets that we would need but the problem is is if you put assets you need to have a policy when you fund a reserve that those reserves stay for what it is because once that because it want to be used for other capital projects right a reserve for for exactly that those strategies so but you could end up with like 100 reserves how do you how do you create the policy and and mitigate those big you know when we don't have capacity you know there comes a point when you are underfunding so much that you're leaving a problem for somebody else yeah pay me now or pay me more later right? pay me now pay me more later but how do we keep it i can take the money and i could dump it into an account but if we haven't got the right policy to keep it there for what it's meant to be because hey look i got money look we can use it for this right so if, if Preface this a little bit of humor here. If I had the exact answer, I could pull out of my pocket. Yeah, it'd be worth a billion dollars. <laughs> but, but the, the longer, more, more complex answer is that um, it's about decision making, right? So, so uh, it's about being informed decision making. It's having, having a system each of of your administration actively managing the inventory condition, reporting on progress, being able to inform council's policy setting. Uh, and you'd be able to provide your governance and oversight into how is that policy translated. So I'll give you, um, and then there is no rules or reserves. I'll give you a bit of a personal example. I was in the city of Saskatoon. Anybody been to Saskatoon the last 15 or 20 years? If you've been driving by a, a major street, they've got sound walls everywhere. And they started building those 18 or 20 years ago, and they set up a reserve. And Saskatoon is ingenious. They, they set up a reserve, but in year one, they funded a little bit. And in year two, they funded a little bit more with the same little bit. In year three, the same little bit. So in year five, you've got five of these little bits that are built into the budget, it's like a pin print. And so I was there in Saskatoon, and people were actually, citizens were complaining, well, don't build sound walls behind my house, because I don't want it. Like whole neighborhoods are saying, stay away. So I talked to the city manager, saying, we should really think about revisiting this policy. This seems like a bit of a runaway. We put money in. Money goes in every year, it's on fire and forget mode, and the community is saying stop. And we actually talked to council about that. You want to know what the council said? They looked at each other and some of the, some of the longer serving councillors said, you know, it took us forever to get that money in there to leave it. They, they, they knew that we know there's some bumps, there's a, there's a struggle getting in, we know there's some bumps right now, but we want to, we want to stay focused on the long term goal. So, I, what I'd submit yeah. is that the long answer is a, a good, healthy, ongoing regular conversation between uh, current state, uh, progress, deterioration, future pro future prognosis, prognosis, and policy input, oversight, and, and that's right. And you can all, and, you know, and council always has the, has the, has the is, a, is a liberty with the majority of votes to do whatever they want with their money. That's the long answer. I know. It's free. It's I get it. I got it. Billion dollar sale. Mm -hmm. Did you get part two? Was that, yeah, that was part one or is that rolled up? Well, they were both together, right? Like it was like <laughs> the capacity portion of it. Like where, how much, when it comes right down to it, I mean, we've kind of kept a, a drip, the drip effect, because it's the drip that fills the bucket, not the splash, and keeping the, keeping the reserves built up. I mean, but have we got enough drip going into the bucket to give us the capacity to deal with yeah. the future? And that's where a 10-year, you know, plans yeah. And, and I'll just flip back to this other slide. So well, I had a finance you director. Like I had a finance director who I worked with once who um, used to, and, and so it was a city of Moose a little town, of sort of a city of about 30, 40,000 people. They had $85 million in the bank in 2000 or 1997. A huge amount of money. And and um, the finance director and I were actually talking about this. We, we actually felt it was the policy path council was on, probably. Um, had lots of money in the bank, but it was just stuck there. They're spending the interest, and, and his advice was throwing the best place for money is in the economy. If you're going to collect it, you're going to stick it in the bank and leave it for 30 years in the bank. You're probably doing somebody you're not, you're not doing somebody a favor. Leave it in the economy where it'll turn and move and all that kind of stuff. So I'm I'm 
I'm a bit judicial with the right amount of reserves for the right long-term plan uh, and pay for the right folks. And I, the reason I went back here is that um, uh, the concept of intergenerational equity. So, so these assets are 100-year-long assets, and they've been paid for by people who you know, moved in here. So they've been paid, 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 paid. Um, you know, sometimes the, the financial conservatives will say, well, you've got like a $40 million expenditure here. We should probably start putting $40 million in reserve so we can pay for it cash when we get there. Um, you know, the, the sort of the unfortunate thing is you're making these people who live here pay twice. They pay once, they're paying again. And so I'm I'm a big believer in a little bit of down payment and debt. It's like, like house, I love house analogies. Um, the cheapest house you buy will be paid with some cash. Right? That, that, yeah. The cheapest house you own will pay for by cash. How many people will buy houses with cash? So we're all willing to pay a little bit more so we can manage that cash flow. And so it's it's a bit about financial yeah. and financial policy. What's your what's your approach? How do you how do you spread intergenerational assets across shorter shorter generational residents? Um, who pays now? Pay later. Debt borrow. Cash fund down payment. Will and they're they're all unique for yep. every circumstance. Any other questions? Yeah, there's probably ten more. Pretty well. Yeah, borrow. Sorry. Interest is cheap. That's right. It is. That's any other questions? Thanks. All right. Yeah. Thank you for having us. That was very good. Great. We shall go on to uh, public hearing. There's no business arising. So we shall go to 69, which is the asset management draft pulse. Good evening again. Thank you, Dorian, for a great presentation. And that was very informative. And thank you for the paper for coming today. Um, a lot of the questions I might be able to answer some, and I hope that I'm nearly as engaged as the presentation you gave. So, so tonight I bring you a request for direction for a draft asset management policy for the town. So as for the asset management delegation tonight, uh, the town recognizes the need to implement an asset management strategy to achieve the meeting of long-term financial sustainability of the organization. The town will develop an asset management strategy to promote the use of asset management principles of all town departments. The purpose of this policy is to facilitate the logical, methodical, and informed decision making for the life cycle planning of assets to, to achieve greater sustainability and effective allocation of resources. The policy specifically addresses the need to, one, provide a consistent and accurate means of tracking and reporting of the town's assets including the planning, creation, operation, maintenance, and disposal of those assets, provide a framework which enables the town to promote and enhance the provision of services at a level that balances customer expectations, that level of service that Doreen was talking about, with cost and business risk, meet legislative reporting and organizational financial planning requirements. Attached to this request for direction is a copy of the Asset Management Policy and Procedure. The Asset Management Policy outlines the reason for the policy, definitions, and responsibilities for its implementation. And the procedure outlines the strategy objectives and what will be done to implement those. Both the policy and procedure will be covered in this request for direction. So recently adopted provincial legislation requires that municipalities prepare a three-year operating and a five-year capital plan. The direction and implementation of asset management policy strategies and plans directly support the identification of capital projects set up new requirements and may be reviewed as future necessary prerequisites to make informed decisions about what's to be included in the financial plan and the capital plan. So asset management, as it evolves for the town, priorities are going to be determined and reprioritized for the capital projects where they may be required. As Dorian also mentioned in the 2016 Municipal Sustainability Plan, there are five sustainabilities for the town, and buildings and infrastructure has been identified as one that includes the entire built environment in Black Falls. The following are excerpts from there. So Black Falls is a livable community that people seek out for its high quality of life. The town takes a proactive approach to the growth of new infrastructure and repair, that the town invests in infrastructure across the entire municipality, and the buildings are of a high quality design and environmental performance. 
The following objectives will be implemented as part of the asset management strategy. First, clearly define the levels of service that support customer needs and meet regulatory requirements while accounting for risks, costs, and available resources. Establish and maintain a record of the value and depreciation rates of all tangible capital assets owned by the town. Review on an ongoing basis business processes related to asset acquisition, maintenance, disposal, and service provision. Establish a set of corporate standards that ensure consistency in the decision-making process as to how assets are managed. Modify business processes as necessary to improve operational effectiveness and efficiency. Ensure legislative requirements and regulatory standards are met. And finally, achieve continuous improvement in asset management processes through ongoing improvements to data quality and provide increased forecast reliability. So for the staffing requirements for this, the development of a comprehensive asset management plan for the town of Blackwell to require extensive research planning and departmental communication. This will be primarily facilitated by a new position for an asset management coordinator. Key staff leading the initial leading the initiative will attend formal training on asset management best management practices. The project will be led by a cross-functional asset management team called the Asset Management Advisory Team, or the AMNET, made up of subject, subject matter experts in their functional departments. Members of the AMNET will complete formal training, distance learning, as required. The town recognizes that a new staff member will be required to develop and implement this, which will be a GIS specialist slash asset management coordinator. This asset management coordinator, GIS specialist, will also provide GIS services across the town, including for planning and development, environmental services, as well as the asset management role. They'll also be responsible for leading the asset management strategy development and inventorying of the town's assets, which will be a major component of this um, strategy. Administration would need to secure a successful candidate by Q1 or Q2 of 2020 at the latest in order to move forward with the proposed asset management strategy development timelines noted in the table there. So the first milestone is going to be review and data, which pretty much outlines itself there. So that's review of existing policies and strategies, outline the key objectives for the strategy, which we mostly have, um, update the project timelines, confirm any grant opportunities, and submit applications for that, develop key focus areas for the framework and strategy, and develop a participant involvement program that identifies key internal and external stakeholders and customers, and as well as what the stakeholder engagement sessions will look like. So next, that would be from 2019 to 2020. So next will be the asset management advisory team. So that'll be establishing the AMAT team members, conducting internal workshops with AMAT to determine internal requirements, and summarize those findings and recommendations. Consultation, that'll be conducting the stakeholder engagement sessions and summarizing those findings and recommendations to include in the plan. <clears throat> Next will be draft plan and council. So that incorporates all AMAT external and customer consultation requirements and then present that draft handle, draft plan to standing committee of council. And then the final plan will incorporate the relevant feedback from the standing committee of council, finalize it and publish it. So to ensure the success and the longevity of the asset management strategy, administration proposes to update council at prescribed intervals to share progress and receive input. Administration will work with various internal departments to ensure both current and future development and operational needs are accounted for as part of the asset management strategy, planning implementation, and monitoring. So financial implications. So right now we don't anticipate financial implications, but it will be developed through uh, future refinements of tasks. So administration's recommendation is that standing community of council move to recommend that policy 139.19, being the asset management policy for the town of Blackwell, to be brought before council for formal approval. And in alternates, that the standing committee of council does not recommend that the draft asset management policy be brought forward to council for consideration. And second, that the standing committee of council refer back to administration for further information. Excellent. Thanks, Laura. Questions? Councilor Taylor. So my question is, is this is 
strictly capital. We don't let any operational into the asset management. It's just a capital, or do we allow for some operation? Like it's going to make it extend the life of it, so it becomes capital in that way. Or how do you? Where do you? Where do we draw the line between what we're operating on and what our asset, you know, capitals? So as we go through and we identify what our assets are, that will that will currently be as part of our operations. Mm -hmm. Our capital program will be for the development of new assets through renewal or acquisition. Okay. Uh, so I'm just looking at the, the objectives, uh, particularly bullet three, where you're talking about the business processes like relating to asset acquisition. Uh, one of the concepts that I've heard a number of times at, at different uh, symposiums, et cetera, is the value-based procurement policy. Is that, is that, how does that tie in this? Because obviously that when we're looking at projects, uh, purchases, future purchases, with, if we're adopting a value-based procurement policy, it's looking at the value added from some of these. And I see that there's an overlap when it comes to the asset management um, and planning. Uh, is that something that maybe we should look at as part of this? If we're going to consider that kind of process, does the administration have any consideration for the value-based procurement policy? Supply chain management policy, things like that, that tie, you know, obviously you're going to have a, a team that's, that's addressing the planning for our assets. Uh, I think the business plan behind the purchasing and planning for those should, should integrate with it. Yeah, so for sure, we can definitely consider that as part of the uh, review and uh, okay. um, So how is our asset management currently being taken care of? Is it through each department individually? Partially, yes. In some, for some, some of the assets like um, uh, Fleet, for example, it's taken from a corporate and the rest uh, department. Thank you. When you're looking at the assets that are going to be uh, necessitated through the GIS, where in this project, the plan, are we actually going to be looking at utilizing the GIS person to? Your underground assets and to really um, map it. Is that going to be done starting right in, in year one, or is it going to be one of the later uh, steps that this person is going to be populating the information with? So, our goal with the asset management coordinator is that they keep the ground running when it comes to asset management um, collection and incorporation of existing data. So right now, Stantec has been handling all of our underground assets, so we'll be getting that data from them as well and putting that into our systems. One of the goals for this asset management coordinator is to evaluate different asset management, spatial asset management programs out there and what's going to be the best for the town so that we can start to map that. Um, I just had a question about, um, in the procedure uh, 2.1, talking about the staffing requirements, I'm, we've already identified that it's going to be a new full-time staff member, so I just wasn't sure if that part needed to be in the procedure, um, because once that staff member is acquired, do we have to change the procedure? Um, just so the, the last last in the line of 2.1, it says a new full-time staff will be required to support the asset management initiatives for the town. Mm -hmm. I was just wasn't sure if that should say that the AME team will be made up of subject matter experts in their functional departments as well as the asset management management coordinator. That's correct. Yeah, it should. It should take that yeah. Okay. We'll I just that. thought because then that would be revising a procedure right away. So yeah. Thank you. We'll make that change. Okay. Thanks. Any other questions? Uh, we're looking for a motion then. Mayor Poole. I move that the Standing Committee of Council 
move to recommend the policy 139.19 being the asset management policy for the town of Blackpool be brought before council for formal approval. Any debate on the motion? All those in favor? Carried unanimously. Thank, Thank you. you. We move on to uh, 6.2, which is Children's Services Contracted Funding Update. Oh, sorry. I think we should have done budget. I think we switched to so one this morning. Yeah. 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 So that would have been you would be six three. You okay? Um, what do you want to do? We swapped six one and six four. Yeah, we're still getting we swapped. Oh, we just swapped them. Yeah. 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 We're still getting. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. 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 All right, so everybody has sort of heard a little bit about this new um, Children's Services um, Family Resource Network. I'm trying to wrap my head around it. Um, there's a lot of new information. Um, I gave a bit of an update to our CSS board, and I'm just going to read through that, and then I have some more information to add to that. So the way that the Children's Services Ministry is aligned contracts throughout the province has changed. The town currently is in a contract agreement with the Ministry for our Community Capacity Building Initiatives within our CSS team. The Central Park on Parent Link Network is also in a contract agreement with the provision of parent link services in our region that we're aware of and we're quite familiar with and we appreciate greatly. So the Ministry in the Family and Community Resiliency Division has changed the model that will be used for provision of all services. This model is called, is being called, is new to us, the Family Resource Network Services. So Family Resource Networks are an inclusive and accessible family-focused, child, youth-centered, community-based center that offers a full continuum of prevention and early intervention services. The Family Resource Network will provide universal, targeted, and intensive program services and supports based on the needs of families and children and youth aged 0 to 18 years. They're defining the core service delivery domains as number one, child development and well-being supports, number two, community, or sorry, caregiver capacity building supports, and number three, social connections and supports. So this is the piece that we currently know with our community capacity building initiatives. Um, so over the next few months, there's going to be a lot of question and answer sessions. There was one posted last Thursday um, that supports anyone that's interested. You don't need to be a qualified service provider, of which we are, but if you're an agency in the province that's interested in supporting or uh, bidding for this, um, it's open to those as well. And um, understanding how these changes need to be addressed in order to submit our proposal for funding. So as further information is gathered and the implications of these changes are realized, we will ensure the information is disseminated to council. So um, I'm in a couple of meetings this week. Tomorrow I'm meeting with the Central Parkland Parent Link Group. There's representatives from Remy, Anoka, Wotaskwin, Lacombe, and myself from Blackhall is going to be in attendance to have a conversation. Uh, we've had several conversations uh, over the phone, myself and the executive director of Lacombe SCSS. Um, to sort of determine what our thoughts are. This expression of interest is still using the language of parent link centers. Um, they define what our service regions are going to be specific to a uh, population size. They divided the funding available into three different groups. They're going to be servicing family resource networks in small community areas, which we grouped with Lacombe County, which includes Bentley, um, Clive and Alex, and Lacombe will be grouped as small, um, then there's medium with other areas like Cameron's area and what surrounds them, and then large, which would be our major centers. And those indicators of small, medium, large are going to indicate how much funding goes towards that family resource network. So what they're defining the model as is a hub and spoke model. So this is a uh, this is in direct relationship to the well-being and resiliency framework that we first saw in March of this year. This is conversations that have been taking place at the Children's Services Ministry for many, many years. Um, I was mentioning with uh, Ben Fimmer Olfert the other night, this is something that we have known since days of neighborhood place. They're, what I'm feeling is they're trying to level the playing field across the whole province. What we see as ParentLink in our area is exceptional. 
Um, we're all familiar with the number of children that go through our programs. We know that we have families from Red Deer, Lacombe, Noka, all over our area that come to our Parent Lincoln Black Falls, that come to the Central Park on Parent Links because they're exceptional. So what might be happening, perhaps, is other areas of the province might not be meeting the need as well. And by leveling this playing field and coming up with a, uh, this family resource network, they're trying to create equity across all um, populations, communities, and a big piece of it is Indigenous, so ensuring that we're meeting cultural needs and those things as well. Another change that we're seeing in the literature is specific to the age groups that are being served. There's a lot of focus on 0 to 18 parent link centers are 0 to 6, and we're familiar with that. But they're also acknowledging the level of funding that will go towards those different age groups. And what we're seeing is, because we're all aware that early intervention is so important, we're seeing a huge portion of that funding being targeted, like 50 to 60 percent, towards our, our 0 to 6 in that early intervention area. Um, hopefully, I guess, as we go through this process, um, just getting to know the literature. I'm really interested in meeting um, with Central Park on Parent Link tomorrow. On Wednesday, I'll be meeting with uh, the Central Alberta Rural Communities Coalition um, that we're very familiar with um, through our struggles and our triumphs of achieving our own Parent Link Center. So this group is made up of Eckville, Delburn, Innisfail, Rocky Mountain House. We have membership from all sorts of areas that didn't have parent link services and then through the last several years we've seen um, the inclusion of our Silver Lake parent link, Innisfail has parent link now as well, and us in Black Falls connected with Lacombe. So as a result of those meetings we will um, see some more information. It's a lot to take in, a lot to sort of understand um, in conversation with Susan McDonald from Lacombe yesterday. Uh, we're really interested in seeing what the deliverables are that other communities are looking at and how they propose to meet those things. So then if I back up a little bit, sort of what they're talking with the hub and spoke model is if we picture a wheel that has a bunch of spokes that go out, the intention is that each area that they have defined for us will have a hub center. And then they can have spokes that fill those core service needs. And that might look like um, core service needs being met to some capacity in Bentley, core service being needs being met to some capacity in all of the other communities if Lacombe is that network and if what does it look like for Black Falls. But what it's also defined is that a hub can have a spoke in another hub. So if let's say Wetaskiwin, if, if for some reason Wetaskiwin um, enjoys the way that the situation is with their parent, like maybe they would like to see if we were to imagine that the current model of Lacombe maintaining Central Park Line Parent Link Centers, maybe they would have hubs that would, or spokes that would then be the Parent Link Centers in a different hub um, area. So it remains to be seen. It's interesting. It's, um, I guess, exciting times to see what comes out of this. I imagine we're going to see a lot of creativity on behalf of the proponents that put forward their response. And I will do my very best to keep everyone informed and updated. We have a timeline of submitting our uh, proponent request package by January 16th. So it's very short, and there will be a lot of things going on between now and then. So I look forward to seeing what uh, comes out of the next couple of days of meetings. Okay. Thank you. Any questions on that? Mayor Poole? Do we anticipate new players coming into the picture and wanting parts of that money that are currently being uh, utilized in such an efficient form by our FCSS and parent link? I wouldn't be surprised. I know the one that comes to mind immediately through the uh, parent link contract that we saw happen in Innisfail was that was awarded to McMahon. Um, agencies that uh, I believe that they have centers in Stetler and Rocky and in Isfail, and it's an agency that meets a lot of needs, not just Parent Link. So I, I wouldn't be surprised to see that opportunity. I know that um, as we go through the process, the province has some ideas as well, and they haven't told us what those are yet, but they've hinted at the fact that they have more information for us as we go through. My question is about funding, and that's 
Um, basically, for SCSS, we, we have lobbied a lot um, because of stats. We've always been behind on what they funding. Now, by blending this all out, will it be harder for us to make business cases for funding? Is it going to be? Is it just a one way of saying I'm spreading it thinner, or is it that they're increasing service? What I get is, is this is they're going to spread the service out, and you know we might see um, a big impact to what we're already doing. Right. Yeah, and I'm I'm not sure. Remains okay. to be seen for sure. It is a smaller budget that we are uh, that like the Lacombe area is able to apply for, just by the nature of how they have determined the group rates. Because Lacombe, um, my understanding of the amount of budget available for a small center is five hundred thousand. So for that family resource network to do the work of that area, where currently the Central Park Land Parent Link for those five centers is a million dollar contract that we currently. So that's half. That's basically what they're calling packaging in a different way of saying we're giving you half the money. Okay. Thanks. Councilor Cooper? I think you mentioned that the funding is based on population, correct? Yes. So do, do we have any indication at this point of how they're going to be determining the population? I mean, I think there was a okay, previous indication. Okay, so because yeah. I know that they've indicated they won't accept municipal census anymore for provincial funding, that's, is that the case in it? I don't feel like these are municipal numbers that they have in here. Yeah, and all that we have is a grouping. So for the Lacombe, Black Falls and Lacombe County, Alex Clive, Black Falls, Bentley area, they have determined that the zero to 18 population is 7,135. And then the adjusted child population weighted for Indigenous children is uh, 7,535. So where those numbers are from, I'm not sure. Well, it would be nice to know if, if you're going to be meeting over in the next few days for this, if, uh, if possibly you could raise that question. Because mm -hmm. I think that everyone's kind of curious now how accurate our population uh, are going to be. Thank you. Any other questions? Would administration like a motion to accept for information? Councillor Bell? Uh, I move to accept Manager Board's presentation. Okay. And I should have brought both my managers up. Any debate on the motion? Yeah. All those in favor? Carried unanimously. On to uh, 6.3, which is volunteer management travel policy. Right. So this is a new <laughs> process here that we're proposing. So what uh, we've done is we've gone through and we have looked at a bunch of comparables. Uh, the communities that we looked at are Red Deer, Cochrane, Edmonton, Okotoks, St. Albert, and Silver Lake, looking at how they have their volunteer management policies and what that looks like. The policy that we, the only policy that we have currently that deals with volunteerism in any way, shape, or form is our um, policy 5908, which is a little bit outdated, because it was current in 2008, that um, identifies some board and committee policies. So what we've done is we've taken a look at um, what do we use volunteers for in our municipality. And Currently, what we're seeing is three separate streams. We have our council appointed volunteers, and we have our events volunteers, and we have our programming volunteers, which are more ongoing. Um, so what we are looking at, we did some review of a bunch of different municipality bylaws. Some municipalities have all of their board and committee bylaws embedded in one. It is just one bylaw, and then they go through and have terms of reference for each of the different committees and boards and commissions. And what we have um, is we have a series of boards and committees and commissions in Black Falls that have a variety of different um, purposes, whether they require training, whether they act under their own um, legislation, um, whether they are advisory to council. 
So what we are, and, and I, we've had many conversations administratively about what might be a process to um, look at and what we are suggesting, and we are very, very open to suggestion, is that we have a volunteer management policy which outlines how we deal with volunteers and the important key points there. And then we would then have three procedures. What we're seeing tonight is only the first of three. This procedure is specific to council appointed for committee and commission volunteers. What, um, if this process seems uh, reasonable, if it seems workable, that we, we can continue down this path, we will then, um, at next standing committee, be able to look at the procedures for events volunteers and for programming volunteers, which would be more ongoing that are supporting different activities. Specific, the one that comes immediately to mind that I can speak to is our youth programming. We have volunteers that support youth programming every week as it goes on. So someone that is sort of consistent and is mentoring those sorts of things. A little different than events where we often have individuals come out, support us cleaning tables at pancake breakfast, or um, supporting us at kids zone during black belt stages, or, um, gathering donations for Christmas Bureau at uh, the holiday train, those sorts of things. So what uh, what we've put together here is in the volunteer management bylaw, taking a look at our different comparables, coming up with a policy statement, um, which reads, the town of Black Falls recognizes and values the contributions made to it by volunteers and is committed to providing volunteers with opportunities for involvement, safe working conditions, and recognition for their contributions. Um, and what we're doing, the reason for this policy is providing consistent volunteer practices for the Town of Black Falls Boards, Communities and Commissions, programs, services, and events that involve municipal volunteers as we learn more and more about um, health and safety and ensuring that we are in line and that we have all of our ducks in a row. This, these are important things to keep in mind. So we're defining a municipal volunteer as an individual who offers the time, energy, and skills to any Town of Black Falls initiative uh, without remuneration. So then there's a series of responsibilities, starting with municipal council, um, to approve this resolution by, or by resolution this policy and any amendments, consider the allocation of resources for successful implementation of this policy and the annual budget process, which we already have embedded in our budget with our volunteer appreciation. Um, we also have volunteer support. We have the volunteer budget through our XCSS uh, proposed budget, and we have had for several years. Um, Recognize the benefits of volunteers and volunteers, and then serve as an advocate for volunteers and volunteers. And then all of these things um, outside of uh, approving this uh, policy, all of these things are already doing. So then we have our CEO, um, again, implementing this policy approval procedures, ensure policy and procedure reviews occur and verify the implementation of them, serve as an advocate for volunteers and volunteerism. Our directors, again, ensure implementation, ensure this policy and procedure is reviewed every three years. Um, it's a timeline that we feel is reasonable considering that um, we have some policies that are a little updated that we just need to get in alignment uh, with the work that we're currently doing. So if we put a timeline on it in three years, as, as our organization grows and changes and potentially um, opportunity for other volunteers and efforts uh, come about, we can ensure that they're added and included. And make recommendations to the CAO of necessary policy and procedure amendments and serve as an advocate for volunteers and volunteers and managers. Again, understand and adhere to this policy and procedure, ensure employees are aware, ensure section staff are trained in related procedures, serve as an advocate for volunteers and volunteerism. And the employees to understand and adhere to this policy and procedure, recognize the benefits of volunteers and volunteerism, serve as an advocate, obtain training on management of volunteers and volunteer programs required. And that's very specific um, to our OHS. What will happen is we have a volunteer program of it supports the screening and going through and ensuring that we have all of our due diligence done and we're placing an individual in a situation that is appropriate. And then what happens then is then that volunteer or group of volunteers is then through the volunteer program or working with the staff member that will be um, directly on site, whatever it is. A great example is Black Policies. We have one volunteer programmer. We have multiple things happening throughout the town. Everyone needs to ensure that they have had their tailgate meeting to go through all of their hazards of the site, what that looks like. All of the volunteers are aware. Um, they know the rules and they know who to ask or who to come to if they should have any questions or concerns. So they work with the staff to ensure that the staff are aware of their responsibility as the leader and mentor of those volunteers for whatever that activity or program or whatever that looks like. 
closely, and then making every effort to support and engage municipal volunteers effectively and respectfully. Another super important piece of utilizing volunteers is making sure that they have a job. You don't want to bring individuals in to help only to have them stand around and not really feel useful. They're volunteering of their time with intention, and if they just sort of wait around and don't really feel like they know what they're supposed to be doing, that's not effective. And they're not going to feel um, a sense of accomplishment and that if they don't have something actually for them to do this, that's really important. <clears throat> so this is our proposal for the volunteer policy, which what we then have next, and this procedure is to be the Council appointed board and committee and board committees and commissions procedure because what we'll see is additional procedures as well if we like this process. Um, as I said before, we're very open to suggestion and thought and, and that. So what we have here is very specific using our um, 5908 um, policy as a guide. There's a fair bit of information in here that is reorganized but is, is included. So what we have done is we have, as a purpose, council appointed boards, committees, and commissions bring local knowledge, expertise, and experience to areas of civic concern. The scope is that we have four different categories of boards, com committees, and commissions, uh, with the first being public advisory, a board, committee, or commission that acts in an advisory capacity to council, quasi-judicial, a group that upholds the principles of natural justice, making decisions that are legally binding and are subject to review by appeal courts. Ad hoc, a group established for a specified period of time and for a specific purpose. And governance is a board committee or commission established in support of legislative requirements or to support council's governance role. So by way of this procedure, we have currently established boards, committees, and commissions that fall under public advisory, being our rec board, our EdTAC, SESS board, and our policing committee. Quasi-judicial is our SDAB, subdivision and appeal board. And governance, we have our municipal library board and municipal planning commission. So then we have, um, falling back on some of the language from our last policy membership, members are appointed by council resolution at the annual organizational meeting or at a regularly scheduled meeting of council as necessary through the volunteer screening process. And then we've attached our appendices, which we're all familiar with, that we've seen quite recently. A new one is our volunteer reference form. Um, so we have our volunteer form, which um, is, is a bit altered and changed from what we saw in past years. We're all familiar with it, having just recently gone through the York meeting as per HR and um, some legal consultation. We made some little changes there. We have our reference form um, for information's sake. This is what a volunteer reference check looks like. This is the process that our a volunteer program goes through, and we have our volunteer appointment recommendation process, which is which we used to go through our work meeting this year to set up all that information. Um, this 4.2, I can't find this document. This is coming from the old policy. Members shall be appointed on the condition they adhere to the Alberta Urban Municipalities Association ethical guidelines and conduct for members of council while performing their role as board committee or commission. Commission member, that is from a resolution made in 1993. The closest thing I can find is the. Sorry. We have that in our board meeting, too. Is that document, though? Uh, no. But I don't think that ethical guidelines of conduct for members of council is the document. Yeah. We'll, we'll check that before okay. we bring it back. Yeah. So we just need to make sure that that's the appropriate. So I have to council code of conduct for me, I um, and then verbatim, 4.3, although members are appointed for the appropriate term as defined in the board committee or commission's terms of reference or bylaw, their appointment will be reviewed annually by council at the organizational meeting with the appointment either being confirmed with council or council as council sees fit. At the conclusion of a member's term, members may reapply for another term. Council will encourage new membership. However, all applicants will be considered equally with appointments being made by council based only on the merits and qualifications of the person applying. And then 4.4, the... Chief elected official by virtue of the office is a member of all boards, committees, and commissions to which council has a right to appoint members, and when in attendance possesses all the rights, privileges, powers, and duties of other members. As a consequence, the CEO and deputy CEO may act officially as alternates to any council member who cannot attend the meeting within board, committee, or commission they are appointed to. Um, 4.5 members of SDAB cannot be members of the municipal planning commission and vice versa. 
4.6, employees of the town are not eligible for appointments to boards, committees, or commissions. By way of resolution 258-96, immediate family members of town employees and councillors are permitted to serve on boards, committees, and commissions. 4.8, former councillors and former town staff may apply for appointment to a board, committee, or commission after a two-year hiatus from that capacity with exceptions to be made at the discretion of council. 4.9, all members appointed to a position on a board, committee, or commission must follow the voluntary screening process, including the provision of criminal record check, including the vulnerable sector check within 60 days of appointment. So then this, this gives us that timeline that we're requiring in order to ensure due diligence and following on with our wage and So then the responsibilities, boards, committees, and commissions function within the authority set out in their terms of reference, applicable bylaws, and your provincial legislation. And then we have listed all of the bylaws, terms of reference here. In the appendices, these are all of the current ones that we have. Um, there shall be appointed by the town through the CAO an employee who will be designated to serve as the administrative liaison to assist and advise each board committee or commission. Meetings are open to the public as required under the NGA, except where it is appropriate and permitted to consider a, ma a matter in a closed meeting, and meeting minutes shall be circulated to council by a council agenda. So, what what we are not seeing here, and I appreciate um, your worship, the comments um, today in regards to what we had in our past municipal policy handbook with the within our board and committee policy. There was discussion surrounding standing committee of council, as well as um, some staff administrative committees. So um, listed in here, we had staff as a whole, health and safety committee, and the bargaining committee. Now, as this procedure is specific to council appointed volunteers, those pieces, the standing committee of council, falls under its own policy, and the committees of staff, health and safety, and the bargaining committee as well are not appointed by volunteers of the council. So those will be dealt with in different policy, which yeah. is would be a procedure bylaw. Procedure bylaw. I got a message about it, but I didn't write it down. <laughs> <laughs> So what do you think? Thoughts? Questions? Concerns? Here we go. Uh, Councilor Kenny and then Tell and then Scrum. Okay, so regarding policy 4.8, I don't think that a two-year wait is necessary. Why would we want to prevent good public servants from serving on our boards? Just as a well, I have a comment. Found it in another, a couple of municipalities by us. I would like to see that removed. Okay. I was just going to say our other policy states that uh, council members can't be part of, can't work for the town, but that has a limit of six months on it. So it seems that a volunteer capacity to have a limit of two years that just saved okay. extra was, was given so would we like to see it um, be consistent with that six months, or do we want to remove it altogether? Uh, so I would like to see it removed. This is a volunteer capacity. It isn't a paid position. I understand a six-month wait for a paid position, but I don't understand why we would ever put a hindrance on people who would like to volunteer for our town. Perfect. I think we've had discussions in the past that uh, you have a former council member um, that is looking to be appointed to the board. A uh, council member uh, could have been, it would have been in a decision making capacity uh, within the term uh, of those uh, members of, of that board or committee. So I think uh, that's a discussion that we mm -hmm. I believe that we've had in the past on this on this uh, specific subject. Uh, we need a little bit more review and, and bring that back for further discussion. Um, thank you. I just had a couple of questions. Um, so in this policy here, so in the procedure part 4.1, uh, it talks about how members will be appointed by council resolution. Um, however, we don't talk about how we're going to be advertising positions throughout the year if they come available. And that was something that we had discussed and I just didn't see that listed anywhere here. 
Um, we did talk about other municipalities that post vacancies on their job site, like similar to the uh, actual position. Um, I did have another question, 4.3. Will there somewhere be an explanation as to what uh, what could potentially cancel a person's term on a board? Uh, that falls within the terms of reference, I believe, and their bylaws. Each bylaw outlines their missing meetings or... Okay. Um, yeah, I was just asking here, um, uh, reviewed only by council at the organizational meeting with the appointment either being confirmed or cancelled as council sees fit. I just wasn't sure. So that would just be under each specific board's terms of reference. Uh, I think... I don't know if we've ever had where we have at the York meeting determined someone is no longer going to be sitting on the board of committee. Yeah, we wouldn't term it council, we would use terminology like we would. Okay, okay. Well, that was just my question because it says they could be canceled, but there was nowhere where it said what could possibly consider a person being canceled. And my last question um, was on 4.7. Um, stating that immediate family members of town employees and councillors are permitted to serve on boards, committees, and commissions. Is there a stipulation there that they cannot sit on the same board as their immediate family member at the same time? Uh, I and have not there is a resolution. Okay. So, yeah, yeah, that is coming straight from the other policy. Okay. Um, and sorry, I actually have one more. Uh, 5.4. Um, talking about how the meeting minutes will be circulated to council via the packages. Will there be a time frame put on that? I know we currently don't have one. I just wasn't sure if it was also planning to put that. Do we want one? It was just one of the things I noted. I noticed there wasn't a time frame, so I'd be interested in hearing what everyone's thoughts were on that. And those were all my questions. Councilor Slob. So going back to Councillor Stendi's 4.8, I agree totally there shouldn't be a constraint on it. But if somebody sat on a board for six years, just like the two terms that we've had with normal volunteers, I think that should be taken into account. And the 4.1 that Councillor Powell was talking about with um, the advertising of boards later in the year if something comes available, I do think that it should be advertised for two weeks and something should be in there and how it should be advertised. Can I just get clarification on your comment regarding 4.8? Yeah. Um, you're wondering about the volunteers have completed their full term? Like if they do can do full two-year terms, like the normal volunteer? So I would like This to... is specific to former councillors and former town yeah. staff. Yeah. So if they've served on for a six-year maximum they should still have that one year break like a normal volunteer would have doing that. so it's not in reference to former counselors or former town staff it's specific to former volunteers it would be no for counselor and community volunteers not for council if they've sat on that board for six years they should have to have a one year break just like As volunteers for example i served on council on the library board for nine years so therefore if i left the council, then I shouldn't be able to expect to sign up for the library board next yeah. year. Thank you. Very close. <laughs> 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 um, I do agree with Councillor Appel, and I think that we need her provision here regarding um, immediate family members not serving on the same board as committees as council members. Councillor Taylor? Well, that's the item that I was going to talk about. I can say about 10 years ago, we had a councillor and her husband serve on the rec board, and maybe a little bit further back. Um, they worked very hard and did a lot for our community at that time. I mean, there was no issues. They probably both, their commitment to the board and to the community was very intense. So. Um, I don't know, I look at that circumspectively. I guess the thing is, is we're in a different time. We have a lot more volunteers. So, but it's something that, you know, just because the people who are willing to step up to the plate and do a good job, 
just because they're married doesn't necessarily, you know, that's their passion. It's just like, uh, so I have a hard time with that. I, I like to think about that. I appreciate that, for sure. Pastor Hoover? I'm just looking at uh, 4.6. Uh, I know that we're trying to focus specifically on town control boards, commissions, uh, but I believe we do have some staff that sit on other commissions. For example, I think, I think Director Weirin sits on the Regional Wastewater Commission. I'm just wondering if we should specify board or town control boards in here just to not inadvertently make council uh, appointed something. volunteers. So does, does council appoint those uh, family members to those other commissions? It's not uh, ta ta town staff I'm talking about. So like as I use the example, Director Weirin sits on, I believe sits on the wastewater commission. So I mean, we, so and as a council, we made that decision. He's not a council appointed volunteer. Though. We appoint. Well, it, it does specify may, that staff can't sit on that may, may I the sure. that To the chair. So, with the commissions, with the wastewater and our, um, water commissions, I'm the appointed member. We have an alternate <coughs> appointed member. Any staff who attend are not appointed to it, they are in support of the um, appointed member who is there. So, they do not have a vote in the commission. And they are not, therefore, part of the commission. Okay, I misunderstood. I thought Director Warren. No, I thought that in that one example, at least he was part of the commission. He's just an advisory role. He's in an advisory role. role. Thank you. Any other questions? I do believe we need a motion. Oh, uh, sorry. Yeah. Mayor Pope. So, one question that we do have, and. Uh, with the library board, they are external out of the governance board. Would it be reasonable to maybe request if they'd be willing to provide us with their minutes from their meetings? Can we not currently receive them? No. So, I, and I think we'd have to go back into the governance um, the act and find out whether or not they're, but possibly as a goodwill gesture, you may not have any problem with it. Okay. Absolutely. Yeah. I guess um, we still need a motion here. Or is there any further questions? Just one to you, administration. So with this policy, it will not come into effect or will not be brought back to council until the procedures and policies that inclusive that are included for the procedural bylaw for the other committees have also been finalized and brought to council so that we're not having two policies in effect that are going to be counter, counter uh, contradicting each other uh yes your worship uh, we're looking for um Forward to bring this back to the December Standing Committee with all three procedures and having a total review of the policy and procedures together uh, before advancing it to Council for approval. And that would include the procedural bylaw with the uh, um, staff committees? Right. There's uh, right. obviously through discussion today, there is a need to uh, have a look at the procedural bylaw and make some adjustments to that as well. Thank you. All right. Uh, see any other questions? A motion then. Yeah, I was just going to say, I think uh, at this juncture, we would just want to uh, accept this as information right now so that we can bring it. Councilor I will make the motion to accept this as information. A debate on the motion. None, all over there. Here, you none. Thank you so much. Awesome. Thank you. Much appreciated. We are now on to uh, 604, which is the budget for two roll up. Uh, thank you. So, a uh, uh, short time ago, November 1st and 2nd, that Quite a while ago, we had our budget retreat, and 
that it was uh, another uh, successful uh, workshop with some good participation. Um, at that meeting, uh, administration had tracked uh, a, a number of comments and uh, directives uh, uh, from council through our discussions. And so we uh, uh, dropped those into uh, a spreadsheet uh, for council. And so you've seen that some have uh, budget implications and uh, some don't. I'll just run through them quickly because there isn't a lot of them. Uh, one was a citizen budget and uh, there were some discussions on uh, the survey and some need to uh, uh, review the process uh, prior to the next uh, rounds of, uh, of uh, budget survey processes. Uh, Rebranding uh, was discussed and uh, uh, vote resulted in uh, leaving that in as a capital item. Uh, there's discussions of electric vehicles uh, uh, for the municipal municipalities program and grants that uh, uh, are made available for that. Uh, administration has uh, looked at that grant program. Uh, we will be bringing information uh, um, back to council in the future. Uh, definitely uh, ice reserve procedure is one that, be, that will be considered uh, for the new facility. Uh, tax notices. Uh, there's a directive <coughs> of council uh, to use video and other means to assist in communicating to the public on the school tax portion of, of uh, their tax uh, bill um, so that they're aware that this is uh, it's a provincial uh, requirement for us to collect those. Uh, Abbey memberships uh, and in lieu of the cost of living for council. Uh, council's decision was uh, not to take uh, cost of living uh, for this year. Uh, there were discussions on uh, memberships in lieu of discussion took place on that and uh, that will not be proceeded upon. Uh, there is a, a question on uh, with human resources and the question is why expense for criminal record and intervention checks uh, uh, as to why we're paying for those. Uh, as per Article 8.1 through the QP Collector Agreement, the town is reco uh, required to cover costs uh, for these and that's associated with uh, returning students at the Abbey Center uh, and at uh, the parks and facilities. So that's what that uh, line item is for. Uh, administration uh, communications and marketing, increased cost and subscription marketing. Uh, subscriptions required uh, uh, include C clicks fix, which was previously expensed to IT. So that item, um, that specific item was moved over under communications and marketing, which uh, increased uh, that budget amount. Uh, information technology, uh, cost center is over budget uh, per year by about 50%. Uh, an adjustment uh, reversal from crude cables will happen this year. This will bring that budget line <coughs> to balance. I think this was relative to uh, diamond software. And so there's a double pain there. Uh, protective services uh, policing, uh, there's questions on the total uh, uh, contract amount, uh, total contract amount of representable to the staffing contract, and confirm that the, the amount shown, the nine hundred fifty-six thousand dollars, is for eight positions, which is their current municipal establishment. Uh, there was also a request to, to receive stats on the RCMP crime map, and that information will be gathered for a later date. Uh, also, an inquiry as to if we pay policing costs when members assist from other detachments. Uh, and uh, through uh, uh, discussions uh, with uh, our detachment, uh, if we are short municipal members and have to call it replacements, we do pay. However, if understaffed, we would not be paying for those contract uh, salary dollars. Uh, so I was told that that uh, uh, normally balances out. Uh, there's an inquiry as to how many members work of the detachment. Um, that includes uh, 32. Uh, members, including uh, two GIS, which stands for General Investigation Services, that are paid for by Lacombe and Red Deer Counties. The town pays for eight members, and the remainder are paid either by federal or provincial governments. Uh, protective Services fire discrepancy in the current amount versus actual for telephone costs. Um, this expense code uh, includes telephone, landline, cell phones, and tablet, our alarm lines, and uh, one. Charges. I don't know what 
one charges it probably according to the court, but WA and Pardon? <laughs> okay, <Yeah>. thanks. <laughs> uh, analysis of the cost allocation be done to reassess allocations across the organization or after that will be undertaken. Uh, utility rate revenue, uh, what the percentage is of revenue uh, revenue of utility rates of flow back to reserves, and that amount is 21.5%. Uh, community services, parks, and playgrounds. Uh, inquiry of the cost of flowers and uh, whether we should be reducing those. Uh, council voted with the decision to remain the status quo. And uh, community centers, Abbey, um, possibility of charging admission for children under two. Uh, we are tracking numbers through our MAC system and we'll provide data uh, at a later date and on an ongoing basis. The direct board will revisit uh, next year after reviewing collected data. Uh, community Services Abbey, do we want to continue with food, food in, inclusivity? Uh, rec board recommends to have it remain in place. And the also inquiry as to if we are breaking even on programs offered, it was confirmed that we are breaking even. Uh, for uh, personal development days, we will cancel insufficient participation and we use drop in option for adult classes. Also, with the Abbey inquiry relative to tracking uh, use, summer versus winter. Hours of operation was reviewed at the rec board and recommend, recommend the status quo minimum staff are on at the end of the day operations. So there isn't a major um, decrease in costs uh, by reducing uh, the hours of operation uh, back at the latter part of the day. Uh, both services discussions as where we go with service in the future. Administration, administration will bring us Item back to council the first quarter of 2020. Um, administration and infrastructure services inquiry as to what the advertising budget was used for. Uh, it has not been utilized. Um, it's a placeholder in the budget line that will be removed uh, in, the, in the next budget year. Uh, development services, economic development, questions as to why budget for travel has increased while other cost centers have seen reduction. Uh, same amount was budgeted last year, but some of the funds allocated uh, were done so on a different line item. Uh, attendance at the Whistler Convention is every other year, and uh, this cost center includes registration and other costs um, for committee members uh, participating <coughs> on the board as well. Uh, legislative services. Um, so these are the budget changes um, that were determined uh, through the budget retreat. And uh, following, um, you can uh, see down through the list there, uh, there is a, a total accumulation of uh, approximately $138,000 in uh, budget reductions um, that were gleaned uh, through the budget retreat process and, and following. So they're, they're listed there. Um, and those numbers will be carried forward in uh, the draft. Uh, coming forward for council's review um, at the next uh, council meeting. Uh, so the objective of bringing this forward tonight um, was just to go through these and uh, provide that information to council um, to, um, um, I, I guess, uh, uh, reduce the necessity of having a discussion when we bring uh, uh, the budget back uh, for council's uh, further deliberation. And I'll answer any additional questions that come from the committee now. Councilor Hoover? Just a clarification and then a question. I think when is your wide area network and internet, internet charges, right? Okay. Uh, just looking at the utility rate revenue that goes into reserves. So how, how do we turn that? We look at uh, actuals or cost recovery from the previous year. And then we add 21.5%, and that's how we budget it. Is that, is that the verification question? Or do we need pressing? He knows. Don't be polite. To answer that question, um, it's pretty much the percentage uh, in Department 41, 42, 43 year um, utility supported uh, business units. Um, the transfer reserve is that bottom number. Um, I'm pretty sure that divided by the total revenue gives you that 21%. So it is a budgeted amount going into reserve. 
it's going to like a cost recovery from the previous year. That is your question. Okay, so the, but we're determining that by, are we looking at the previous year to determine that, what the cost recovery was? Not so much looking at the previous year. Um, we're taking rate increases, um, the regional um, costs that um, you know, Town of Blackhawk will get paid, and then trying to maintain that, that uh, I think it's around in the water, it's around that 900,000, um, if I remember correctly. That 900 divided by a certain amount of revenue gives you that 21%. But we do not um, look, go backwards, basically. That number could change. It could be like 23% of the following year, depending on if we find any efficiencies. It could actually go down, um, depending on the, the regional water commission cost. Okay. And just further on that, so that's including water, wastewater. Does that include garbage? Are we setting aside from reserves away for their yeah, transportation? All, yeah, for sure. All, all three uh, self-supported um, business units have got transfers to reserves. That corresponds to the new capital plan as well. Um, you will see um, on the funding um, side there that we are using those funds in, in the upcoming years as well. And once again, just to touch on the asset management, once we have better information, um, all these numbers may change. Um, whether that 21% is going to be sufficient at this stage, that's what we're putting away, whether we need 31%. Um, but once we get, get uh, through the asset management development, uh, we will have a number um, whether it's whether we can meet that number or you know we put too much away, we try to doubt it. But um, those numbers will get refined throughout the year. It won't be so much of it as guesswork. It says you know, the asset manager will say, "Yep, for the next twenty years, you need to put away twenty-three percent, whatever, whatever that amount is." Probably be a dollar value, not so much a percentage. Okay. Any other questions? Then a motion. Answer steady. If you promise to spell check it first, because there are a few mistakes, <laughs> um, I will accept this as information. Any debate on that motion? I saw lots of mistakes too. That was a good mistake. All those in favor? Hearing you now. All right, uh, actually, of course. Action correspondence 7.1 in Alberta Fair Deal Panel Research. Just cut that one. Here, both. Uh, did the administration wish me to speak on this, or did you wish to? Uh, you can do your worship. As most of us have seen in uh, um, AUMA and the Alberta government reports over the past week, the Alberta government is launching a fair field panel research pro, uh, research initiative, and through that, their councils and members on council, as well as individuals, are going to be asked to respond to the various initiatives that are being moved forward. I wanted to bring this to a council's attention in order that we can all bring ourselves up to speed. And one of the things that they are also that I'm just really confused about is that I passed out this Main Street um, Fair Deal Panel Research Order form. We have the opportunity to, if we, and, and the way they put it is uh, to complement the information you might be submitting to the panel, they will provide us with more information or more services in order to supplement our submission. And I would like council to really look at it over the next couple of days and to find out where, where this council should stand on a submission, whether or not we want to form a subcommittee to look at the recommendations and bring back to council uh, uh, recommendation for a council submission whether counselors wish to do it individually. And again, if you can see some things that would be valuable for counselors or council to have as far as the submission form, they are quite significant. The cost of them are uh, on the bottom of the second half of the page, uh, depending on the population of the community, uh, between 17, I, I believe we fall into the 13,000, uh, I'm not positive about that, for a submission um, request. But I think we all need to become more more aware of this initiative over the next, that's going to happen over the next few months. Uh, we will find that the um, provincial government will move quickly on it. 
They will ask for submissions and they will be looking at moving forward their initiatives uh, that are considered important to our current government. And we need to be able to, I'm hoping that AMA will also step in and provide us with some uh, assistance in doing submissions, but at this point we don't have any and I think it's we lose each of us to uh, do our homework. So that was all I wanted to really bring forward to uh, council at this time. So maybe a motion for information? Sure. Okay, I'm there, go ahead. I move that we accept the information on the fair deal panel research for information. That'd be worded. <laughs> the submission on fair deal uh, panel research for information. He always does. <laughs> A uh, question of debate. I I really don't know exactly what they want. Like I, do you? Through the chair, again, it's a very recent initiative. Um, Premier Kenny has presented it to the Calgary, uh, I believe it was Chamber of Commerce, or uh, there was a speech that you could uh, that you could follow through from the government fair deal research panel where he, he um, announces this initiative and talks about it in a fair amount of detail. He is very uh, conversant and very explicit. So go into the government of Alberta fair deal panel research. And there's a lot of information in there that will be useful in making your decision, including the speech from Premier Kenny. Councilor Pell. Um, just one question on that, um, Mayor Poole. Would you be able to forward us all this email just because in the PDF book and so forth? I can do that. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Uh, any other debate or question on the motion? All those in favor? No. Oh, uh, I just have I just have one. I'm not sure if you can answer it or not, Mayor Poole. Um, so by applying to the fair deal panel am i correct in assuming that we are agreeing to all of the provisions listed on the first page thank you through the chair i believe that, that is one of the stipulations that we will be we will be having to agree with again um, this is brand new and i wanted the council to have the ability to look at all of the things in there so my initial response was yes, and that's why I handed this out to you in paper form. So the motion currently sits to accept this as information right now. Any other debate or questions? All those in favor? Here you know, so. 7.2 Parkland Community Planning Services Invitation for Services. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to advise the committee that uh, we received uh, through uh, Mayor Poole and myself uh, an invitation to join Parkland Community Planning Services. Uh, they're a, a regional planning uh, cooperative. Um, the uh, town of Black Falls has had utilized their services a number of years ago, um, pre-existing uh, my term as a CAO. Um, we, um, uh, currently we uh, look after our planning service uh, in-house and uh, with the assistance of our consulting services. Uh, definitely uh, this is uh, a budget item uh, that we haven't included uh, in the current budget. Uh, we have had uh, discussions with Parkland Community Planning uh, previously looking at the possibility of them providing uh, GIS uh, services to the municipality on, uh, on an as-needed basis. Uh, however, um, at that time, the decision was not to move forward with that. Um, definitely, uh, administration uh, can look at the services uh, provided by Parkland Community Planning Services and 
bring this uh, item back to council for further discussion and review. Um, but at this time, uh, we have no further information to offer to the committee. I see we have questions. Uh, Mayor Poole and then Councillor Thank sure. you. Thank you, gentlemen. Um, I had one question. Um, if it would be interesting to know if this comes back to council with more information, what the charge would be for a municipality of our size. Because it only states $2,500 for a community with a population of less than 750 people. Right. So for us to think if anything, could, we would just have to know what it approximately would cost for a municipality of our size. And I had two questions of what they could help with. One was, could they help with our GIS? And the other one, um, it'd be interesting to see what they think about our surveys and get a professional opinion on our surveys and how we're asking those types of questions, um, as that is something that's come up several times over the last couple of years. Thanks. So, through the chair to um, CEO Thompson, would you bring this back to a council meeting with further information and a recommendation from count, from administration as to whether or not we should uh, send them back a letter saying that, saying whatever council chooses, or, do, or are you recommending that we uh, reply to them that council is not interested at this time, uh, but we will consider it for future? I worship, but uh, we could uh, reply to counts, uh, reply to Park Country <laughs> find that we have reviewed the information and we'll be bring back uh, uh, or having some further dialogue with council and we'll provide a response at that time. Um, we need an opportunity to have some further discussion uh, with infrastructure and property services uh, to determine if there's any, any further gaps. I did have a preliminary discussion uh, with uh, the director and planning uh, the Planning Services Manager, um, but it will require some additional follow-up on that. So uh, we will bring this back at the standing committee. So. Yeah. Thank you. 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 So just in the interim, as it was addressed to me, can I send them an email and state that, and state that or will you send them an email and state that? <laughs> I'll, I'll forward an email, Your Worship, and mention that we had some brief discussions that you could be providing uh, for your Thanks for that. I'll refer back to the menu. Motion would be appropriate. Uh, anyone would like to move that? Councilor Bell. Sure. Uh, I move that we refer the PCPS uh, email back to administration for more information. Any debate on the motion? All those in favor? So we've got uh, no information, uh, round table, adoption of minutes, uh, notice of motion, business for the good of council. Does anyone have anything for, to the council? I have one item. Anyone else? Uh, <clears throat> Councillor Taylor? Yeah, I planned on uh, attending the KP GM, but my daughter has asked me to give her a hand in Rocky, so I'll be working from like six in the morning till ten o'clock at night, doing some renovations so she can sell her house there. So um, I will not be in attendance. I sent uh, the mayor. Uh, you're attending. I sent him regrets. So if anybody wanted to hand and say, I I've never not been to their AGM, but um, for those reasons, uh, I get to be slave labor for for five days. Uh, my item just happened to uh, notice on our calendars we have no invites for council meetings or standing committees. Yeah. I did get a long break. No, yeah. we'll, uh, we'll update that. We had a, a bit of a lapse there, but we'll uh, definitely bring those up. Great, thank you. Uh, so there's no confidential either, so I adjourn this meeting at 9 12. Static stuck out. Yes. <laughs> <laughs>